Hello and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. We'll be answering those gardening emails for the next hour. If you'd like to submit a question or a few pictures for a future show, just send us an email to byf at unl.edu. We do need to know as much as you can tell us about that question. Please tell us where you live. We hope you'll understand that really due to the number of questions we receive every week, we cannot possibly get everybody's question on the air. You can search for answers on our social media pages, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest. And as always, we start the show with samples. And Jody, we've had so many questions about this critter this year. Yeah, we're gonna one. try to do this safely. <laughs> so I brought a wheel bug. We've got so many calls in the last, I would say all season, because people started seeing these wheel bugs as they were, don't fly away, <laughs> as uh, they were nymphs. And so they actually did not have that wheel that you see. They had like a arched kind of back and they've got really long legs and antennae. So people may think that they are spiders. Mm -hmm. But uh, these are predators. They're generalist predators though. And the reason I'm not holding this one is because it can bite um, or jab. So it, it doesn't need to feed on blood. It wants, it actually can pierce the exoskeleton or elytra of the Japanese beetle. And if you can see that long beak-like mouth part, that's typical of a true bug. So it, it sucks fluid and it just happens to do this out of other insects. So we are having some calls of people getting bit by them. So we just wanna um, kind of like puppies or dogs, you want to ask first before you can handle. And because they cannot talk, you probably just want to leave them alone, let them do their job in the garden. But they will mate and lay eggs and those eggs will overwinter. So we like seeing them because they are beneficial, natural enemies in our garden. I think they're so cool. They remind Thank me you. of some sort of a dinosaur <laughs> with that, yeah. you know, the wheel on the back. Yeah, Very we've cool. had so many calls. Yeah, so. it's fun. All right, Rock. Mine doesn't bite. <laughs> No, it just spreads like a weed. Oh, God, it, it must be a weed. <laughs> Not in my house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much, in some areas, that's all you've got, right? Uh -huh. This is wild violet, and, and the, one of the reasons I brought it in today is that the, this is a perennial, it's a broadleaf, so we're approaching the perfect time for control, whether it be chemical or non-chemical. And um, it loves the shade, it, it can be tolerate really close mowing. So it can be fairly invasive in, in, a, in a home lawn situation or an industrial lawn, but it spreads by two ways. It's got really small rhizomes, and unfortunately I didn't get this pulled up, the soil was a little dry, but it's got really small rhizomes. So um, pulling it, if you don't get it all, then those rhizomes will re-sprout. And it also um, spreads by seed, and I'm not sure I can hold this well enough for the, but it, a single plant can have, um, oh, nicely done. You see all those little, um, white things in there that look like insect eggs or not, they're seeds. And this one is half of a pod and a single plant can produce uh, five to 10 pods. So do the math and you can realize, and, and it's got really high germination. So it's prolific spreader. Um, if you wanna control it, you can actually hand pull it relatively easy. Um, you wanna get that before it goes into winter and then um, s start sending out new rhizomes next year. Or if you wanna use a herbicide, the 2,4-D only herbicides will not work on wild violet. Anything that has triclopyr, a common name that we uh, stay on the show quite a bit, will work really well on wild violet or any of the combination products. If you're gonna use anything with dicamba, as, as actually I would say, don't use anything with dicamba in the home landscape because of, of the injury to trees and woody shrubs. All right, excellent. Thank you, Rock. All right, okay. we always love to have you on this time of year because yeah. you bring that. <laughs> bring, bring the limelight hydrangea. So yeah. actually, this one, I, and I'm not sure why, maybe just the timing of it, it's more limey looking. So mm -hmm. A lot of times are, it's kind of bleached out and more mm -hmm. white, so. But anyway, so um, this is the time of year, and you see them around town, and um, we're, we're starting to see these really put on their show right now. Uh, so this is a pretty large uh, hydrangea. I cut this back hard, you know, you know right around about a foot, uh, leave the canes about that tall. Uh, and so right now it might be, well, it's over six foot tall. So it, it grows well and, and I have a few dozen blooms on there, rocks down the street. There's a few dozen on there, I would think, right now. It's spectacular from the from the road. Yeah, so it's pretty big. So it's a good plant. It um, it's one of the panicle hydrangeas. There's a lot of them out there right now. So some different colors are they're a fun plant to have. Um, so then the other thing I have down front here is a, a branch off of a pawpaw, 
and you can see the fruit here um, and then the leaves and, and really kind of the point of bringing this, we've had some questions this year about pawpaws. Mm -hmm. um, they're, you know, it's a native fruit tree. It grows in Southeast Nebraska natively and into Missouri and Kansas. Uh, it really is kind of pest free and disease free. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, we have all these questions about diseases and pests and what are we gonna do? And this is one that really doesn't require any sort of treatment. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, as they mature, you're gonna start getting fruit off of them. And so it's an edible fruit. There, you have to take some care in preparing it, but um, so that's something you can make, you know, baked goods out of typically is what people will use it for. But it's really easy to grow, tolerant of our Eastern Nebraska soils and mm -hmm. maybe something to consider if you're looking for a, a fruit tree in your yard. And we have a lot on campus, so yeah. people can come see them on campus right. and see what they look like. Excellent, nice job, all. All right, Jody, your first set of uh, insect questions. The first one is pretty interesting. This is a Grand Island viewer who sent us this, and her question was whether she could use it on hollyhocks and roses for Japanese beetles. She she has the word neem oil in here, but... Okay. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, and it's confusing. Sometimes we get a lot of products, so we usually do recommend neem oil as, like, an organic... This particular product has a mixture, so when you see the label and it says active ingredient, if you look under there, it's got pyrethrins, and it's also got a synergist that's PBO short form, and then it's got the extract of clarified hydro something, clarified extract of neem oil. So that's the neem oil part, but this is actually a mixture. But as for the question if you can use this on Japanese beetles, you can go to the manufacturer. So you can go to Benide and you can get the product label. It does say it's labeled for Japanese beetles and it's labeled for ornamentals, flowers, shrubs, whatnot. So that is something that you could do. And I believe it's every, you know, repeat every seven to 14 days. So you can. And anytime you see in the active ingredient line there, it's got the extracts of neem oil. So that is a neem product. Excellent. All right, your next one is a, what are these insects and how do I get rid of them? Yeah, so that's a bad case of <clears throat> squash bugs. They're, they're very bad right now and they lay eggs in like multiples of like 20 or 30. So that's why they, they're they nymphs right now in this picture. Uh, what you can do is probably try to knock those off into soapy water. Some of those plants look pretty sucked the juice out of, but, um, or a shop vac, if you need to use chemicals, it would probably be like, um, like a carbaryl or a pyrethroid at this time. All right, your next one is just a question. Are these milkweed beetles? Well, they're milkweed bugs. Mm -hmm. So yeah, these are probably the large milkweed bug and they, they feed on the seeds there, so the, the pods. Yeah. yeah, there's Brilliant. a lot in there. The yeah. backyard farmer garden too. They're I know. Pretty. <laughs> then we have one from Plattsmouth, and they said these hundreds of worms were also on a milkweed plant, stripped it, and the next day they were gone. What were they? Yeah. Oh, they were gone. Oh, you didn't even get to see the cute phase of them. So these are the milkweed tussock moths. So they're the other caterpillar that feeds on milkweed, but they eat the whole entire leaf, as you can see, and they usually eat the older leaves and they eat in large groups of yellow caterpillars and then they turn into those fuzzy shih tzu looking dog caterpillars, so cute. <laughs> Orange and black and white, so sorry you missed them, but clean that milkweed up and it'll be fine. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rock, your first three pictures are from an Elkhorn viewer. Uh, she has some grass in her yard that somebody called golf grass. She tried digging it up. Uh, She's tried Roundup, she, nothing seems to get rid of it, several patches, it's just getting worse. And she sent those three pictures of what it looks like in its hussock or its tussock and then the plug there. Uh, kudos to them for sending three pictures so we could look at it in the environment it's growing. The, she refers to, somebody referred to it as golf grass, G-U-L-F. Um, that is actually uh, an annual ryegrass. Golf grass is an annual ryegrass with a fair, relatively wide stem and this is a fine stem grass. It, you could have replaced the U with an O mm -hmm. and called it golf grass because this is creeping bent grass, the grass normally used on golf greens and depending upon you know the, the upper end, sometimes it's in fairways and that sort of thing, but it can, in, it can get into a home lawn and extremely difficult to control. The, the viewer mentioned that they uh, sprayed it with Roundup and good luck with that because uh, glyphosate-based products do not work very well on uh, creeping bent grass. You may tinge it a little bit, but it'll come barreling back. Um, so you need to get a combination glyphosate and um, like there's some horticultural oils like, uh, God, what is it called, scythe, 
uh, which is, and those combinations seem to do a better job. Um, digging them out, you have to get, get really large because it's got stolons that'll go below the desirable grass, whether it looks like that might be fescue, but even if it's bluegrass, we'll get below the bluegrass. I'm, I'm pretty confident in the, in, the, in the identification. So interestingly enough, the product tenacity will smoke bent grass in bluegrass and fescue. So consider tenacity as a possibility as well. But I would wanna you know, get a little closer picture of the grass before I start telling you to spray it with tenacity because if it turns out to be something else, the results may not be as positive. But I'm relatively confident that that's creeping bent grass. Excellent. Your next one is a Lincoln viewer. Um, He's saying circular clumps of this thick bladed grass that appear more and more. He uses a pre-merge. He's tried multiple applications of Weed Be Gone. What is this and how does he get rid of it? So the, the growth pattern, you know, once again, without a, a closer picture, it's hard to definitively identify. But I'm identifying this based on the brown patch lesions on the leaf and saying it's um, tall fescue. But this would be one of the more common types, like K31 or similar. It spreads by seed. Birds eat the seed head on the roadsides, and then they'll spread the seed that way. So that's probably how it got invaded. And it does grow in a clump pattern. And unfortunately, there is no selective control. So you have to spot spray with Roundup a couple of times in the fall and be prepared to reseed with the desirable grass in the spring. All right, excellent. All right, you have a series of tree questions tonight, Jeff. Okay. The first, uh, this is a big white pine in Omaha. Right. And then the second picture shows the question, which is the roots are visible on the ground. Wonders, right. should they cover them with mulch? Um, could they cover just the ones that are exposed? And what happens if, if uh, they leave them as they are? Uh, well, if they leave them as they are, Probably what happens many times is you end up getting uh, increasing damage to them from the mower, mm -hmm. so uh, which will shorten the life of the tree, and and then you're going to have a dead white pine. So uh, I think your your best bet is to go in there and and carefully use something non-selective to kill the grass and and mulch and mulch as far as you want to go. I I think they mentioned they didn't want to do too much, but mm -hmm. I think as much as you can do. And, and that's why, and, and depending on how long they've had, they've been in, in control of this tree, that's why we typically don't limb up white pines. Right. Uh, because they form their own little uh, ecosystem there with their needles and take care of all of it, and you really don't have to worry about much of it. So. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's tough to have roots and lawnmowers in yeah. contact. Your next one is a, uh, it's in the country near Missouri Valley. Mm -hmm. It's a maple, <laughs> about 30 years old. She says it looks like the the, the roots look like the bark slid off the tree. Is do you see this frequently? Is this okay? Is what's going on here? Yeah, I think it's it's really kind of the same thing with the uh, white pine, and uh, I don't see there being anything as a concern here. It sounds like the tree is healthy, and and I did see some mower damage on these roots. Mm -hmm. So I, again, that's another reason why we would mulch out away so we're not running over the roots with the the mower and and all that. All so. right. Your next one is a near Beamer, Nebraska. And this is a hole in the trunk near the base of a red maple. Mm -hmm. And you can see how it hits the ground kind of straight up too. Right. Um, so had some trouble with rabbits near this as well in the winter. There seems to be some stuff going on in the hole. She says that the circumference of the tree is 18 and a half inches at this point, but the tree itself looks healthy. But is this a concern? You know, I think it's something I would keep an eye on, obviously. Um, you know, again, my suggestion would be to let's pull some of the, the turf away from the tree, uh, have a mulch ring around it. Um, it does seem like it, it may have been planted a bit deep. Um, and at this stage, there's probably not much you can do about this, other than I think just making sure we don't have mower blight on it. Um, that would probably be the best suggestion at this time. And keep it, if it's healthy, those wounds, I see that there's callus forming around those wounds, so I think from that standpoint, we should be in good shape. All right, just keep your eye on it. Yeah. All right, thank you, Jeff. Well, here at Backyard Farmer, we've encouraged you to visit your local farmer's market if you can't grow your own food. We took our camera to the Lincoln Sunday Farmer's Market to look around and see how they're dealing with the COVID-19 restrictions. We actually started as the Old Cheney Road Farmer's Market um, back in early 2000s. Um, this is our third year here on this site. Um, 
Some of the farmer vendors got together when they realized that they were in look, they needed a Sunday farmer's market instead of just the Saturday option. Um, and they came together and started that over at Old Shaney. Um, we moved to this site um, a number of years, years ago. Um, some of the great aspects of the site is just it's really within the community. So it makes it really walk, walker friendly. So local food is really important, um, especially now with the pandemic happening. And so that was something that really motivated us to try and figure out a way to keep moving forward, even with COVID in place. Um, the board um, in market management, we worked really close together um, trying to get our bearings at the beginning of the season and figure out what strategy is best for this market and for this community. Um, we looked at a lot of lessons learned and samples of other markets, some of them that are running year round. Um, so some markets actually are doing drive up strategies or they're only doing prepaid pickup. And um, we felt like having the opportunity for the customers to interact with the vendors, although in a, in a more um, socially isolated you know, um, measure, so six feet apart, but still be, uh, having that interaction and that connection with our farmers and our other vendors was super important. So we've done a number of things. Um, one of the most visible changes is that our booths are spread out farther apart. Um, so it's, it's almost a, a 10 foot space between each booth. So that allows for better social distancing. We also have the 10 to 11 o'clock hour specifically for those that are 60 plus and immunocompromised, um, trying to give them an extra space. And then um, we, we require that vendors, staff and volunteers wear their masks. And we ask that um, customers do the same. We ask that um, all food is, that prepared food is taken to go. Um, as well. Um, and we've been slowly evolving and shifting um, since we opened. We originally, we delayed our opening. Normally we open at the end of April. Uh, and we, we took a small um, break with all of this COVID stuff. So we took a minute to try and get our bearings and figure out how to best um, create a safe environment for our customers and our, and our vendors. Um, so we actually didn't open until mid-May. Um, and we've been slowly pivoting throughout this process, trying to fine tune things um, and make things that uh, adjust that allow for, um, for safety as well as flow and, um, and really the experience itself. So although the social impact, the social aspect rather of the market has had to take a step back, we feel like the, the core of the market is still really strong. So local food for local eaters, um, we're trying to really focus on being an outdoor grocery store in this time where we're having to have that social distancing. They do seem to be doing quite well and it's great to see everybody participating, keeping those farmers markets open and doing business. And that's one of the ones I go to and I, I really, they're really doing a great job. All right, Jody, your next set of questions is, this comes to us from one of our great master gardeners in Gehring, and this is one of the oaks and one of your favorite mm. galls. <laughs> yeah, and I did a lot of reading in the last week about galls. There are over 600 galls in North America, and most of them are either on oak or roses. Oh my. Right, so <laughs> when I looked really closely, I could see like the fuzzy, galls on the inside and the underside of the leaf. So this is some kind of woolly leaf gall mm -hmm. for the oak, oak woolly leaf gall. Mm. So there's not really a whole lot you can do about that. Yeah, it just sort of looks like. Yeah, it just, galls make everything look really bad, but there's not a lot of management that can be done at this stage. All right. Your next one is also from uh, Gehring, and this is Hackberry. And uh, he says, I mean, he knows what this knows is. What yeah, so these are hackberry lace bugs. And mm -hmm. he, he, this is a great picture because it's got like the frass and it's got adults and you can see they're sculptured. They look like lace, that's why they're called that. And then you can see the nymphs too, which are kind of spiky, spiny little bugs, but they um, suck the fluid out of there. And sometimes if there's a lot on the tree, they'll like actually fall down and start like probing people. Oh dear. So they don't like, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. kind of like, like the campus. minute yeah. pirate yeah. bugs, right? They're yeah. just doing that. but. Yeah. There's not a whole lot people do with these either. Sometimes you can spray them off with a hose, but they fly. 
so when they're adults. So yeah, all right. It makes our hackberries look kind of sad this time of year. Yeah. All right. Your next one here is this is the continued bur oak question from Brownville. You have two pictures here, and I know we went back and forth on this one for, between all of you. Uh, the, yeah. the tree looks like that. Because I was hoping that it was like uh, the fungus mm -hmm. that causes the gall. And I'm not really sure because the ones that it looks like, they don't usually occur on burr oak. So that's what the difference is because there's like gouty oak gall is what um, Kyle and I had mentioned, but it's not common on burr oak. And then there are a lot of twig galls, like probably, you know, hundreds. <laughs> so it could be one of those. So I would try to, if you could reach those, prune some of those out. But I mean, it's going to be like a a wasp that has caused that, that it's pretty tiny. Yeah, and that's a big tree to, yeah. to be able to do that. All right. Rock, your first one here, uh, your first two pictures are from a Columbus viewer. Uh, he struggled with bluegrass sod. This spring he planted six to eight rolls, fertilized it, watered it, even fertilized a second time. Sod's in a relatively shady spot, does get some sun under a maple. The rest of the lawn is fescue, but what's the deal with the bluegrass right here? So um, people think that bluegrass is shade tolerant and it's not, okay? Tall fescue or turf type tall fescue is much more shade tolerant, but you've also got a relatively dense shade under a maple, right? And, and you've got a little bit of a play area under there. So the sod is not gonna do well, especially since it's bluegrass. So if they really wanna have um, tall fescue under there, then they need to purchase tall fescue sod and realize that because it, even tall fescue, it's got good shade tolerance, but not great shade tolerance. Um, is gonna struggle in that environment. Plus the maple was there first and we know that mm -hmm. sod does great if it's put down first and then the tree is planted, but if the tree's there and it's established like that maple is, the, the, the person that was there first wins. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, this is not a great place for bluegrass and I wouldn't spend money on sod um, obviously because there's a little bit of a play area there. There was a swing in the maple tree then you know they, they want some sod relatively quickly to keep the mud down. Um, then I'd get tall fescue sod and realize that tall fescue is going to do a lot better there, but it's still going to struggle a little bit. All right, and the roots of those maple aren't, that maple isn't going to help. No, yeah. the, the, the maple, it looked a little droughty. The maple's going to win. It's going to get right. the water it needs. It's well established. The sod is barely tr you know, trying and it just can't because it can't get a foothold. And it really shouldn't, we wish it wouldn't really have grass right up to the base of a tree anyway, in okay. my opinion. Good. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Turf guy says no. Okay, so now you have some spots in the yard. The first one here is North Platte. Uh, this is just one section of her lawn that is uh, got these odd spots in it. So when, and I think they're talking about right adjacent to the sidewalk because mm -hmm. I think there's a little walkway in there if I'm right. looking at that picture right. Anytime we don't see extensive damage and similarities throughout the yard, we start to think abiotic. Like this is either next to the driveway or the curb. So it could be anything from um, abiotic, meaning physical rather than, than biological, right? So this is an insect injury. I guarantee you that bluegrass billbug would look very different than that. Mm -hmm. um, I, hopefully Jody would agree with me there or otherwise she could embarrass me and say it is billbug, but I don't think so. Um, it's not a disease because you don't see it anywhere else in the, in the, in the lawn. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this is some sort of physical injury and I'm not saying that it is dog spot, but it could be. Um, one of the things we see is that often uh, next to the sidewalk, people are stopping the mower to empty the bag. We recommend you re return your clippings, but, and then the exhaust from the mower will cause mm -hmm. a little small pocket injury like that. And perhaps that happened once, maybe something else did that, but it, it, that's a physical injury. It's probably gonna fill in, unless it gets noticeably bigger and starts acting biologically rather than physically. I'm gonna say this is gonna go away on its own. All right, your next one is also spots. Uh, started out fine in the spring, now it's looking worse. No dogs, no moles, lawn service does things, and this is Grand Island. Right, and I think they said that they have an extensive, including grub, um, but th this is a location problem based on what they described and what you just described. And um, it, it's a little bit of a downhill slope, at least it, it appears that to me, and it could be a southern exposure. 
Um, you know, they do say that it's irrigated, but it could be a southern exposure. Um, I also, upon, you know, it's, it's, it's a good picture for the general appearance, but I would have liked to zoom in because it looks to me like there's some rough bluegrass in there, and rough bluegrass, Poa trivialis, often goes south in the summer, mm -hmm. and it can come in on seed, it can come in, you know, the birds can bring it in, and once you get a stolen or a little piece of seed in there, and it can establish. So it, I'm thinking this might be Poa trivialis going south in the summertime, which is very typical, or it's just a physical presence in the lawn because the rest of the lawn is fine, and um, and it's it's an exposure. But a little bit closer picture and maybe look for some lesions on the leaves. I don't think there's any insect activity in there because usually we see insect activity move from the curbside where the turf is most stressed up, up a hill, not like right in that spot there. So I'm thinking it's contaminant. Um, rough bluegrass that's going south in the summertime. All right, and you have one final one that is uh, a six-step lawn. And he, uh, he says he can't believe following all this is needed and he's got a large acreage. Is he right? So this would be an expensive but comprehensive lawn care program. There's grub control in there and fall fertilizer and winterizer. And you know if you want your lawn to look like a golf course fairway, you know, certainly you could be this aggressive in the approach, but what, you know, in, on an acreage, this would be cost prohibitive, I would get bet. Mm -hmm. And really, you, 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 want, you don't want this level of fertilizer in a large acreage that you're gonna be mowing with a, all the time. So I'm gonna say that if you wanna choose a fertilizer, there are um, turf type fertilizers that are less expensive, something like a sulfur coated urea, um, that you can get at co-ops and they're in Grand Island, so they should be able to get that at the co-op or at a bigger box store. Um, and it put a put a spring application. Usually in the spring, you're gonna to wanna to put a pre-emergent down. So maybe that one is you physically buy a more upper end type fertilizer. And then in the fall, you want one other application probably in the next three to four weeks. That acreage will look fine with two fertility applications with that first one being pre in the spring. And then if you've got any uh, weed problems, you spot spray with, um, you know, a, a broadleaf control product to get the weed problems or even a crabgrass product if you get away from you in the pre-emergent. And you're gonna be fine. On an acreage, there, you got other things to do besides um, mow because you put on six applications of fertilizer. All right. Jeff, you've got uh, some interesting ones here for your last set. Okay. So um, this is also from Gehring, and this is squirrel damage. Mm -hmm. So that's, I mean, it's just basically Gary sent this picture so people would see that sometimes this is what it looks like. Yeah, it's, and it can be very extensive. Um, and they'll pick, uh, for whatever reason, they pick on a tree, mm -hmm. and uh, we've had them essentially debark mm -hmm. good sized maples on campus mm -hmm. and hackberries. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's not much you can do about it. You know, I try to keep up with it and try to get the dead out of it for appearance's sake, but. That's it, yep. And then your next one is actually a uh, healthy, this is Omaha, 35 year old ash tree all mm -hmm. of a sudden is doing this. Mm -hmm. What is well, it? and you know, and I think they mentioned they, they'd. Um, it's uh, not EAB, they had an arborist. Yeah, like right, has to right. look at it. You know, we've had, and we were talking before the show, some of the, the weather this year, we've had some really windy storms, mm -hmm. unusually windy. And so uh, on campus, we've dealt with a fair amount of broken branches and, and that sort of thing where we haven't had to worry about in the past. Mm -hmm. It could be too, you know, if, if this tree has done really well, we had a good spring that put on a lot of heavy growth and so it's right. just a little bit more susceptible to that, so. All right, then we have uh, lots and lots of pictures of, of dead leaves in mostly pin oaks. And uh, is this, what is this typically? To me, it looks like some sort of twig girdler uh, insect and, and Jody can talk more about it, but it's essentially a beetle that's putting in a place to lay its eggs and then the branches fall off. And I think really the, the main way to control this, and it seems to me this comes, you'll, we'll see it one year pretty bad, then we might not see it too bad for a few, few years then it comes back. Yeah. But if you have this, clean it up. Right. Don't let the branches, because that's where the eggs are. Yeah. Yeah. Break it all up, take yeah. all that out. Yeah, all right. Well, we are harvesting lots of produce to donate and our garden is at its absolute peak. Terry James tells us it's time to make room for fall gardening out at the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're again looking forward to fall. All of our plants are looking fantastic. Our containers are looking good. We're definitely having to kind of deadhead some of that stuff. 
One quick thing to do about your containers to kind of get them through this kind of last hot spell of August into September and fall is to give them kind of one last fertilizer drink of liquid fertilizer. So go ahead, just kind of next time you water, get some liquid fertilizer, give them a good drink of fertilizer. But remember, only do this with your annuals. No perennials should be getting any fertilizer. Also, we're gonna start making sure all of our soils are getting ready for fall. As we remove some of our plants, we're gonna make sure that we're gonna get the soil ready with compost and we're gonna be adding our cover crops. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check it out. We have lightning. Are you ready, Jeff? I'm ready. All right, this is uh, Donovan, York, and Lincoln viewers. The hackberry branches are yellowing. Are their trees dying? Not necessarily. I mean, again, could be squirrel damage, could be a lot of things, but some of the trees may be going dormant a little early with the weather. All right, this is a Shadron viewer who planted white onion sets in May. Nothing happened, they didn't grow. Should they leave them over winter? Well, if there's nothing there, then probably you, you could plant your fall garden at that location now. So <laughs> okay. if there's no leaves, if there are green leaves, then sure, you can leave them and see what happens. Okay. This is a Gretna viewer who watched our segment about Eastern red cedar. Uh, wants to know, he's gonna chip his cedars. Mm -hmm. How does he keep the seeds from germinating and becoming a problem? Uh, that would probably be tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if you can. If you're running through a chipper, they'll probably come through and be just fine. All right. A 25-foot tall shade tree selection for Dixon, Nebraska, which is up by Sioux City. Uh, there's a lot of choices, 25 feet tall. So they could do uh, ironwood, uh, any kind of the carpinus group, so that don't get too tall uh, would work for something like that. Nice. Um, Good choice. So, we'll okay. think of some others and send it to them. Okay. All right. Um, Rock, are you ready? Pass. <laughs> okay, on that note, <laughs> we have another question. This is from a per Peru viewer about um, Quinclorac, because Matt mentioned it, and what homeowner products is it in? He wants it for foxtail control in a tank mix, and he wants it controlled forever. So there are a number of tank mix products at garden stores that you can get, I mean, meaning that, you know, they're ready to use products. You just have to look on the label. The, the you know, Bonite has, or excuse me, yeah, Bonite has one, um, as do a couple of others. I think Earl May has a Clingerlac type product labeled. Or if you want to buy them online, there's a wealth of products online and generally you get them within, a, you know, within two to three days. Okay, all right. This is a McClelland, Iowa viewer. Who wants to know how to control goldenrod and sunflowers in the prairie and the ditches? So they have other forbs that they want to cut, keep alive, then it's hand removal. There's nothing else they can do. All right. Um, we have a viewer who wants to overseed a 25-year-old buffalo grass lawn with fescue because it's gotten too shady. Is that a possibility? They're, they'll struggle a little bit with that in that, you know, the buffalo grass will hang on for dear life even in the shade, so it'll be kind of interspersed, but ultimately the fescue will take over. All right, uh, what do you control white clover with? Um, almost any of the three-way products will work fine on white clover. All right, excellent, nice job. Jody, you ready? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have a viewer who wants to know where you can buy a pheromone trap for bagworms. I have not seen a pheromone trap for bagworms, so maybe mm. nowhere. All right. This is a, uh, a question about a 3 8 inch long little bee, and his question is whether are there small species of wild honeybees, or is that a different bee probably? Or it's probably a different bee. We have over like 3,500 native bees that okay. are all beautiful. <laughs> this is a 30-foot magnolia in Lincoln that does have magnolia scale. She's tried uh, arborists. They don't really want to do this. What does she do? What or what, you, um, what does she Well, use? that's interesting because I would recommend an arborist and I would maybe even consider uh, soil drenching, but that would be an arborist as well unless they're going to locate the crawlers and that's going to be coming up soon. All right. How important is it to remove the squash vines in the fall to get rid of squash vine borers and squash bugs? It's very important. Sanitation is going to be very important for a lot of garden insects. Excellent. Nice job, all. All right. Hi. Jeff, it was a tie. <laughs> four, four, four. <laughs> Jeff, plants of the week. 
Okay, well, we have some kind of in the uh, what a lavender color, light purple color. I don't know my colors. <laughs> anyway, so the tall one is an allium, a millennium allium. And we were just talking, we've planted several of these on campus here just recently as well. So they do very well here. They like a sunny spot. Um, we have, I have allium at home, kind of in the, the verge area. So they do really well there. Don't have to do anything to them. So anyway, so that's a good plant. Good for pollinators. Mm -hmm. Uh, the shorter ones, this white in, in lavender color, is a uh, hardy ageratum. Uh, so there's blue and white varieties. Uh, it's a spreader, gets, what, 12 to 18 inches tall. Mm -hmm. um, good ground cover and likes the shade. Uh, does very well here. So two fun plants. Exactly. And this would be nice in a shady area. I mean, yeah. that, that lightens, that pulls some light there. Right. So it makes it seem brighter right. under there. Blooms for a pretty long time, too. Yeah. So that's a good one. All right, Jody, you've got four of them here. Mostly ID. Uh, the first one here is from Lincoln. Saw this critter the other day in the garden. Didn't recognize him. What is he? Yeah, we've had a lot of these lately mm -hmm. for back your farmer. This one is an American carrion beetle. So it likes dead things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... Please stay alive, viewer, so this one doesn't land on you. Then we have a caterpillar on a black willow here in Lincoln. It is in Lincoln. So okay. he's never seen one before. What is it? Yeah, so it's one of the dagger moth caterpillars. And so those little, the black little spines that are sticking up, those can be very irritating or uh, not, not good for your skin. So I'm glad they're wearing a glove. Mm -hmm. um, it could either be, if it's on a willow, it could be American dagger moth. Okay, cool. Then we have this interesting insect while digging potatoes, and uh, he thinks this is leafcutter bee. This is leafcutter yeah. bee. So these are their little cells where they put pollen in and cover it up with leaves. And so if this was a, one of the many um, ground nesting native bees. Yep, and that was Columbus. And then we have a Valentine viewer who saw this spider while she was tubing on the Niobrara River. What is that? Oh, cool. And this is a type of orb weaver. It's called a furrow orb weaver, just from the patterns on that bulbous abdomen. All right, very cool. All right, Rock, um, you have a couple weeds here since you know them. This is East Lincoln. Uh, these first two are actually the same weed. So this is wildflowers. This grew, what is this? Six feet, or came up lime green. Buds are coming, growing quite, quite vigorously. And the second one is actually Omaha. Same plant, what is this? So this is a kenopodium, which is um, a kind of a weedy annual family. Um, this is sometimes known as a Mexican hat or Jesuit hat, depending upon what source you look at. I, it doesn't really have a showy flower. I wouldn't want it to reseed, so I would suggest they pull it now. All right, then you have a Council Bluffs viewer <laughs> and many others who say, can't kill this. It's growing in the wooded areas. It smothers trees, covered in thorns, cut it, tried glyphosate, but it, the vine laughed at him. What is it? Wow. <laughs> it's, it's cat greenbrier. Uh, Simlax yeah. is the genus. And, and um, this one, this is one of those ones where you need to throw a little 2,4-D or triclopyr in with the glyphosate. Um, or use the ortho poison ivy killer because it's kind of a, a death star for um, these weedy, viney kind of critters that are difficult to control with glyphosate by itself. And then you can laugh at the plant. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then you have a viewer who is, uh, this is Hebron. She's a little worried that this was poison ivy um, or that this had, whatever this is, she wants to know what this is with the little burrs on it. It's an Evans, so A-V-E-N-S, um, mm -hmm. and you can tell by the little seed head at the top of that, it's definitely not um, poison ivy. If, I don't know if she wanted to control it, you know, it's her option, it's not really, it's not poison ivy, so I wouldn't worry about it too much. It's mm -hmm. kind of viney, maybe you do want to control it. Once again, the, the, the uh, poison ivy killer, even though it's not poison ivy, would work great on that. All right. Okay, your first one here we might just say, hmm, and go away from. This is actually a carny viewer, eight established white pines. They started showing these gall things. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, she hasn't found any insects other than some bagworms. What are we going to tell her to do on this one, Jeff? It, this, this is a curiosity, that's for sure. So I, you know, uh, sending in a sample or taking one of those um, branch ends off and dissecting it and taking mm -hmm. some more pictures for us to see if there's something in there mm -hmm. or just what's going on. But yeah, very unusual. Yeah, very strange. It looks like fasciation kind yeah. of. Yeah. 
All right, then you have a Loop City viewer. Um, this tree is six years old, live by the middle loop. The leaves have looked like this. They want to save this tree. Yeah, unfortunately, I think it's probably time to give up and find something else that would do better in that area, so. Yeah. All right, and then we have an eight-year-old maple, 25 feet tall. This is in Cozad. Started doing this, and then they've got a little black on the edges. Seems to be doing well, but and he's done some things like uh, iron granules around the base twice a year. He's used a conifer tree fertilizer spike. He does have uh, irrigation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and, you know, I, I use rock as the example all the time because, you know, he get, tells a story of having, uh, he, we have our high pH soils and you're trying to fix and this, like putting a little drop in the ocean to change the pH, you're just not gonna do it. And, and maples like lower pH soils. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's something, as far as a plant choice in Nebraska, most of our soils are over seven at least, and so you're gonna end up with this, and so it's unfortunate. It's not, get, you're, you can't correct it. All right, and then this is an Elkhorn viewer, 25-year-old maple, mm -hmm. uh, five years ago started the chlorosis just on one side, used 90% uh, sulfur, iron sulfate, drip line, hasn't, noticed any improvement. Yeah, so. so these, you know, these are folks who are doing everything they can to try to right. correct it and it's just, it just isn't gonna happen, so. Right, yeah. You know, it's yeah. unfortunate. Yeah. We, we have we have some beautiful bold cypress on campus that have become these golden cypresses, so. Yes, we there's, do. <laughs> that's the way they are forever then. It is. Well, 10 years ago, we took on a project at Kime Hall where the inner courtyard was quite a mess. This has truly been a team effort to make an eyesore into something that everybody can use and enjoy. Ten years ago, the Keim Courtyard was definitely a space that was in need of a lot of love. Students did the design work on it, Sweat Equity built it, we have great management going on, and the vision that we had for this space and what Mother Nature did with it has turned it into what we see today. The pond is intentionally the centerpiece of our space, and over these decades we've burned out some pumps, we've had to replace a little bit of liner, we've had to do some things with the stones, we've had turtles, we've had baby turtles. We've had plants that have come in on their own that we don't need, but the sound of the water and the fact that we have a pond in a courtyard on campus attracts all the people and all the wildlife. All that hard work and the passage of time has let us create a space that is beautiful, resilient, and restorative to give people that connection back to nature, relieve that stress, and let them enjoy the beauty of the world.
It really is amazing how that area has been transformed from a problem area into this peaceful place to visit, have lunch, or look at the turtles, don't feed, they'll, they'll, they'll eat your fingers. <laughs> All right, Jody, your first one here is, uh, this is an Omaha viewer. She woke up to this on the patio. Is this wasps and what should she do? Yes, yeah, so this is a cicada killer wasp. Mm -hmm. mm, it depends. Right now, she doesn't really have to do anything but be prepared to get some more next year. And then I would just keep that area really wet so that they don't try to nest there again. All right, your next one is a Lincoln viewer. Uh, renovating the iris beds that had declined. He found damage that he's blaming on iris borers. Some of the rhizomes showed the slime. And then he found this, and he found a second and third picture here. That, and then I think our third picture is the slimy mess. Yeah, so this is really cool because this is like the whole life cycle and the damage. Mm -hmm. So you're right. It's the iris borer and you did the right thing. And then for next year, I would start scouting early in the spring. Um, and in the, the summer, check the rhizomes if you get that bacterial rot again in the rhizomes. And then just a lot of fall sanitation. So if they're going to, if there are any moths that develop and lay eggs, if you take away all the old iris um, leaves and everything out of the garden, they'll be gone for next year. All right, excellent. Okay, Rock, uh, your first one here is what is this weed and what is the treatment we recommend? And it's in two-year-old sod. So the sod's old enough. To, this is this is yellow nut sedge, mm -hmm. real common weed. Um, it's too late to treat now. You could spray it for revenge, but you're not really gonna get very effective control. Um, there's, a, there's a product called Sedge Hammer, a product called Dismiss, and it'll just burn them back at this point in time. Um, it, controlling nut sedge is sort of like a lifelong ambition. Um, it takes multiple years of repeat applications. The earlier, better, usually in the first week in June. All right, and your next two pictures are uh, from a viewer who says- Holy moly, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> they removed a bed of perennials and small shrubs. This is in the strip between the sidewalk and the curb. They let it sit, they sprayed the nut sedge, they know it's nut sedge and violets and whatever else came up, looked like a kill. Now it looks like this. So what do they do? How long will it take before they can plant something else in there and not have to deal with the nut sedge? Well, they gotta get rid of this. And, and you know, when they, when they rototilled it, I believe they broke up the ground, mm -hmm. they brought up, the yellow nut sedge can produce almost as much as potatoes on a per acre basis. They have tubers. And so that little tiny tuber about the size of the end of my finger, but they actually, <laughs> come close to the actual yield of potatoes. So that's how many are probably in that ground and they're producing more and more. They're actually competing with themselves now. The, the wild violet is just kind of on the fringe of that. So they have to start hitting it hard. Um, it's late in the year, so I wouldn't be planning anything in that until they had sprayed it pretty much all season next year. Start in the beginning of the year with a broadleaf herbicide for the wild violet and um, a sedge type product, sedge hammer or dismiss on the sedge and spray it all summer long. But that, it's anytime you disturb soil, you bring that to the surface. You brought the rhizomes of the wild violet up and you brought a ton of uh, uh, well, nut sedge tubers to the surface. That's, that's an impressive stand. I, I, I'm thinking maybe you just, you know, you can make a great tortilla out of the tubers. <laughs> all right. No, so, you can. No, oh, okay. <laughs> I believe you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't sound good though, does it? No, not, not so much. <laughs> All right, uh, Jeff, your first one here is, can you identify this flower? Uh, she likes it because it attracts pollinators. She thinks it's a milkweed. No, it's a dogbane. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, and we think hemp dogbane, but there are several of the dogbanes out mm -hmm. there. And, um, and it does attract pollinators. So from that standpoint, it's very poisonous, mm -hmm. uh, hence the name dog bane. So um, I, you know, I think it's probably fine if you wanna keep it, but I would, you know, be careful. Right, might attract the pollinators, but you don't want your dog to croak. Right. right. And I think your next one is also an ID, and that would be, uh, this is a McClelland, Iowa viewer again. Mm -hmm. uh, they they wanna know what this is, is it, and, and they think this is a weed. And how do you control it? Because I know you've had this one on campus. Yeah, this is ironweed. Um, and so it's, it's um, relatively difficult to control. Uh, and I don't know, you know, personally, I don't know why you would. I like it 
Um, mm -hmm. And you know, it's one of these, kind of like the goldenrod question that Rock had earlier. You know, these are plants that grow well in places where other things aren't doing well. Mm -hmm. So if you're not managing your prairie or your, if you have a grass pasture or something like that, you know, I'd look at the management of that and look at improving the management of the grass and that will control these other things. But you can treat it with Roundup or, you know, selectively spray it with some of those. That one also attracts pollinators. Right, yes. So yeah. It's and, a native plant. Yeah, it is. All right. Well, we have some announcements tonight of great things in the gardening world and we're going to start with one that is the Bug Squad special exhibit at the Omaha Children's Museum starting September 5th. We have a URL on the screen for you and that apparently is mostly invasive bugs so that'll be interesting. Our second one tonight is our Grow Big Red virtual learning series continues. Uh, tree selection is coming up this week Tuesday at 7 o'clock. Register at go.unl.edu slash Grow Big Red virtual. We have another one that is uh, Emerald Ash Borer online workshop and you register also for that one at a go.unl.edu URL and it's Nebraska Forest Service and a Nebraska Extension putting on that one. And then we have uh, Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer. You can watch us on Facebook Thursdays right after this show. Follow us on Backyard Farmer and NET Nebraska. And of course, we love comments from our viewers on that. We're also excited to tell you that Backyard Farmer will be extended through early October. We look forward to taking the show further into the fall this year. We have talked about doing this for years because you, our loyal audience, beats up on us when we have to end so early. <laughs> and it's football, so I guess we're not playing football, so you get us instead. <laughs> <laughs> go Big Red. <laughs> go, go Big Red somehow. All right, Jody, um, they sent a picture on this one, but it, it's really, really not a very good one. And it's um, tiny flying insects in the house here in Lincoln. Some are really very visi vi barely visible. Some are small. They look like uh, fly looking. Lots of plants. She's checked everything. She can't find in anything. They've tried fruit fly catchers. Uh, they've used beer, <laughs> but that doesn't work either. What, what would be little insects right now that are flying around in people's houses? Okay, so if they tried to fruit fly stuff and that didn't get there, then it could be drain flies, but they look like little tiny moths. It could be fungus gnats. If you've got a lot of plants and they're overwatered, I would look in the soil, check the soil for little worm looking things, uh, and then dry that soil out. Otherwise, there are other like scavenger flies and that like sewage in horrible conditions. So it would be like if you have a plumbing issue or some kind of drain issue. So I would try to look at drains and see, like put something over top of them, see if you catch anything, some tape at night, see if anything's coming up and then you can treat and clean those out. All right. Rock, we have a viewer who wants to know, talk a little bit about aeration in the fall. We have a little over a minute. So sure. what do we do here? So lawn should be aerated. Um, at at least once a year, and if you can do it twice a year. But fall is a great time to do it. You, uh, you know, the, the lawn has been compacted throughout the summer, and contrary to popular belief, uh, tall fescue lawns do, they're not as thatchy as bluegrass, obviously, they don't really have a thatch layer, but they aren't very compaction tolerant. So we strongly suggest whether you have bluegrass or fescue that you uh, aerate um, in the fall or the spring. You need enough growing time left, so probably mid to late September, you need about 15 to 30 days for recovery and that's the time when it's growing the best. So um, make sure you don't do it too late in the year because then you get these little dead donuts where winter kills around the hole. But yeah, aeration's a great idea and go for it. All right, excellent. And you've got like two seconds. This is an Alliance viewer, Jeff. They want to know whether you can trim a tree root and then dig the root out because they've got surface roots on some spruces which are popular in Alliance. Yeah, no, let's not do that because you'll just kill the tree. Right. So, or it'll end up falling over on top of your car. Right. So, so this falls back into the category of don't limb it up. Right. right? Yeah. And Keep the branches down and let it create its own little space. Right. Yeah. Mulch and all that good stuff. Right. Don't sever that arm. Right. Right. <laughs> all right.